Hey, Goodland Community Church. This is our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, obviously, it's not night. I'm taping this in the morning. But it's a beautiful day out. Hopefully, you enjoy this day. And uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 32. And we're going to talk about change. Uh, my old, my youngest son, actually a couple of my boys, hate change. Anytime Debbie paints, a, paints one of the rooms a different color or changes something, maybe the furniture, the way it's arranged, or... Maybe traditions at Christmas, they freak out. It's kind of hilarious to see, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds uh, whining about how come we painted the bathroom a certain color. And uh, they they like it. They like the house and everything would stay exactly the same. Or the things they remember from when they were kids, they want those same type of traditions, whether it's at Easter time or Christmas time. And it's really uh, kind of been kind of hilarious to uh, kind of deal with the boys. Uh, is a um, you know as we do different things Debbie will do something that she thinks is you know new and improved and looks great and they'll be like oh why'd you change it you know everybody's adverse to change and that's really what we're going to talk about uh, tonight is change and how do we handle change and how we prepare for change obviously we're we're still uh, stuck in lockdown and and our lives have changed and there's this whole conversation uh, in the media about well you know Things are never going to go back to normal. Everything's, you know, things are changed now. And so this whole topic, I think, is really uh, pertinent. Uh, you know, what God teaches on it is, is important for us to understand. But let's separate the two things. When we talk about change, as far as change that's come, come, come from COVID, this idea that we're never going to go back to normal is unrealistic. Um, it's not really right in any way. We want to be back the way we are, the way we were. The idea of being able to come together, whether it's on a Sunday morning, and give each other high fives and hugs and say hi to one another. As people, that's how we, you know, we communicate verbally. But uh, you know, there's that emotional connection, that that physical, uh, whether it's uh, holding someone's hand or shaking someone's hand or high fiving or hugging. Those are all important things. And this idea that we can't have sports and all this is is really kind of over the top and. It's just the typical hyperbole of, of media that, you know, a couple months ago was hyping one thing and now they're on to the next. So we're not talking about that kind of change. What we're really talking about change in our lives. Really what we're resistant to is change in our lives often. And that affects us all the way down to our spiritual walk. I think, you know, like uh, some of us have a really regimented schedule. We do pretty much the same thing every day. We get up the same, roughly the same time. We we got a routine that we go through in the morning and all through our day, and we don't like that to be disrupted. And so we can get into that habit uh, in our, spiritually and emotionally also. And that's, uh, that's something that, that for our daily lives is okay to have a routine, but for our spiritual lives, we should have a routine. We should have we should be in allowing for God to change that routine to God to reach in and reorganize our lives so let's look at the story of Jacob just a little bit of background here um, we're in chapter 32 we're gonna be halfway down we're gonna start at verse 22 as we're gonna start reading but Jacob is is you know, left and they've gone and he's gone and kind of built this life and he's not the most um, through the course of history up to this point, he's not the most uh, manful of integrity, let's put it that way. He works hard, but he kind of connives and schemes and kind of gets his way in different instances. And he's found out that um, he's on the move. He's left Laban, who he's with, and married his daughters. And he's on the move with his whole clan. They're going to move to a new area. And he finds out that Esau... Uh, his brother is coming to meet him. Now, if you remember, Jacob uh, gypped or cheated Esau out of his birthright. And uh, so Jacob's worried that Esau's going to come. He's, Esau's built himself into a powerful man with 400 men around him. And he's really, uh, uh, you know, a mover and shaker during that time. And so Jacob's worried that when he comes, he's going to come and just wipe out his his family, wipe him out and his family out. And, and so the verses before this, uh, Jacob is praying to God that God would intervene and do something. And then we have this incident here. So let's read our story in chapter 22. It says this, The same night he arose, this is Jacob, 
He took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children across the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it you? Why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Penel, saying, I have seen God's face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up on him as he passed Peniel, and limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the, of the thigh. This, or this evening, uh, for our study, uh, you know, change comes over a person fully devoted to God. Someone fully devoted to God is changed. Um, God is allowed to change him. And I know my walk uh, over this past 50 years, uh, being a believer in Christ, that uh, um, I continue to change and get changed and, and get more mature in my walk with Christ. And that's really the challenge for all of us, is to really look at how God has arranged our lives, to look and see those areas that we've kept away from him, and see those areas where we can stretch ourselves and push ourselves uh, spiritually to do more uh, for God. And so, let's look, I think the first thing we see in the first couple of verses is, he knows what he does in from 22 to 24. Uh, in verse 24 it says, and Jacob was left alone. He takes his two wives, his children, and all his stuff, and his flocks, and he, he puts them on the other side of the river. And he goes on the other side of the river, and he's by himself, and he's probably going to time to pray and meditate, and kind of in a way, it's almost like, you know, some commentators think it's like him trying to protect himself with his kids and family in front. Other commentators are like, no, it's the opposite. He put himself there, so if Esau catches up, he'd be caught alone, and his, maybe his children, and and things would survive. Neither way, he's separated by himself, and he starts wrestling with a man. Now, I, th I think the obvious thing, is just a wrestle match would be, you know, the, the terminology here is one of, I think, uh, Jacob understood that this was uh, someone from God, and he wasn't, it wasn't just like some random dude that jumped in, some creeper that jumped into his area, and he's going to wrestle him, and, you know, kind of wrestle him to the death type of thing. This is Jacob trying to not let this, this angel, or whatever he thought he was, a man from God, was not going to let him leave until um, he blessed him. And so that, uh, you know, one thing about Jacob is he's a hard worker and he's very tenacious. And you can see this, they wrestled all night and Jacob just would not let him go. Uh, just kept getting him and holding him and keeping him from, from leaving. And it gets daybreak and he's like, hey, you got to let me go. I got to go. And, uh, and he says, no, you can't leave until you bless him. And so we see that the first part that Jacob is terrified. Um, and the verses leading up to this, I know we didn't read them, but it described them. He's he's scared to death of Esau. He's scared to death that, you know, his sin is coming back to him is what he figures, right? You know, he gypped Esau out of his birthright, and now that's coming all the way around the circle and coming back to him. And so there's a, that kind of that guilt of what he did to Esau, and he knows that there should be punishment for that. And uh, he's concerned about that. And that's probably, you know, too often our sins circle around and get us back sooner or later. You know, sometimes it's not right away. It takes a while to come back to us. But we have that sense. We know that we did wrong, uh, whether it's to someone else or, or some person. And that's, uh, so he's terrified of the situation. And rightfully so. He saw if he would have been angry, he could have wiped out his whole clan. Uh, Jacob was in a position to really defend himself in any way. Um... So, as we talk about change is scary, a lot of times we resist change, and so we're, we're scared to change, we're kind of like Jacob in that way, um, 
a lot of times we kind of connive and kind of work with God and try to negotiate with God to get things our way rather than his way. Uh, that's always a concern. And uh, so I see similarities between, you know, how we go about our lives sometimes in our relationship with God in the way <laughs> Jacob kind of went about his life. And so I think there's some similarities. So if you're one of those people that really doesn't like change, or maybe you even thought about it, thought about how God has changed you. Think about this. How has God changed you since this COVID-19, since we've been on lockdown in, so for March, in the last couple of months? How has God changed you? You're like, well, it really hasn't been any change. I haven't been stretched, I haven't been pushed, I haven't been pulled. Then how deep is your relationship with God? That's really, that's the thing that should make us nervous. If God isn't changing us through this, this literally is an unprecedented situation. I'm not talking about being fearful or anything like that. I'm just talking about how we pushed ourselves. We've got a lot of downtime. Things that are scheduled for some of us is a lot different than it used to be. How have you taken advantage of that time to grow spiritually um, or to start dealing with some issues that you may have? Um, so this is a great opportunity to do that. Don't be scared of change. Change isn't always bad. Uh, change uh, when it comes to what God wants for us is always good. Um, sometimes he takes us through a hard thing to get us to where we need to be. Um, and so that's important to understand too. One of the things that we like to do is um, when the boys were little, um, we got the four boys, uh, Debbie was out doing something for the evening. I take the, my dad used to do this with me when I was a kid and me and my brothers. Um, we take the table out of the living room and kind of make a wrestling arena, right? So you've got kind of some pillows down, throw some pillows on the sides and then all the boys, you know, I get on my hands and knees and the boys would pile on me and we'd wrestle for a half hour, an hour, just let them pound on me, whatever they wanted to do. You know, roll around, the boys flop on top of each other and we just had a good time trying to, you know, get dad down or whatever, wrestle on him. And I always loved those times. But now my oldest is 26, he's 6'4 and 200 and some pounds and my youngest uh, all the way down to 18 and they're all around six foot and a couple hundred pounds and they all lift weights and stuff so the wrestling match wouldn't go so well today uh, I would be pinned very quickly and uh, it would be over uh, without much of a fight with those with those four animals uh, on top of me and uh, so the idea is that if I had to take them on now change is inevitable Look at our look at our passage. Let's uh, let's read uh, verse 24, the second half of verse 24. The first half says, "Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's uh, hip was pulled out of joint as he wrestled him. And he said, "Let me go, for the day is broken." And Jacob said, "I was not let you go unless you bless me." And he said to him, "What is your name?" And he said, "Jacob." And he said, "Your name shall no longer be called Jacob." but Israel, for you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. So he says, I don't let you go until the day is broken. So change is inevitable and we know it is because it's constantly going on. Our bodies change, our situations change, a lot of things change. The challenge is either we're going to grow closer to God or we're going to fall further away right there's no static this idea and this is one of the things that uh, I I've taught boards at churches I've been at and we've gone out uh, in years past I've gone out and worked with other churches uh, with their boards uh, with a good friend of mine pastor friend of mine and help churches learn how to grow and one of the things that, that churches have to understand is there's no static point there's no you know hey we've we've got a little growth curve here and so now we're uh, uh, now we're going to be able to, um, now we've made it, right? So we put in some initiatives, we put some changes in, we've seen, you know, let's say 20 more people come. And so, ah, we've arrived, right? That idea that we've arrived, there, that really doesn't happen in the church. It's like that, same for businesses. Either you're growing or you're shrinking. There's no, there's no status quo. Just because you have the same amount of people, let's say you have 100 people, for a couple of years doesn't mean you're growing or you're you you could be you're just in the process of shrinking it just hasn't happened yet right at some point that the bottom will start falling out and those numbers might be able to maintain that hundred for 
a year or two, but then it'll slowly start creeping down. Somebody has to move away, somebody gets sick, whatever the reasons are, it goes down. You either got to keep refilling the thing. And so this idea that we're not going to change with the times as a church is deadly to a church. I talked to a, a friend of mine who's working with uh, his conference. Uh, he's part of the Southern Baptist, and uh, they have several churches uh, in the in Oakland County that are not going to come out of this COVID. By the time we get back to meeting, their their churches are no longer going to be there. Now, did this happen because of COVID? Well, technically, they can whine and complain that it happened to COVID, but I guarantee they were dead church walking. That they were they were already in the death curve years ago, and they didn't make the changes and adjustments necessary um, to continue to grow, to continue to be a vital part of God's kingdom. And if you're not going to do things for God, either personally or as a church, then the church will. Um, God will move on and put his blessing in other churches that are willing to do what needs to be done. So we can take that same illustration in our lives. If we're not growing our lives spiritually, we're not trying to get deeper uh, with God and really push ourselves and, and, and pull ourselves to a, a higher level, then we're going to go backwards. We're going to separate from God. So this idea that, that, hey, I'm on a routine and I just really haven't stretched myself, this idea that I'm still okay with God is probably not. If you really examine yourself, um, you've probably fallen away from that close relationship you had with him at one time. And so that would be, I think, something we can learn from Jacob here, is that he was just tenacious in the way he wrestled and wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. He was not going to let God go until God blessed him. I love that. How, how many times have you wrestled with God about something in your life and just kept praying about it and praying about it and praying about it and 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 bringing it to them and, and, and tell um, that situation was resolved. Often we pray about it once in a while when we think about it, but we really never just passionately go after it and have that tenacity. And I think in this situation, could could God have, you know, a lot of a lot of Bible scholars, and I, I believe this is probably a pre, pre-incarnate sighting of Christ, right? We see several times in the New Testament where he goes to Abraham and different ones where he'll show up. Then you see this in, in Jacob's life um, where he's there. Could he overpower God or could he overpower Jesus at the time? Obviously not. But Jesus, but God wanted to see that push and pull, that, that tenacity of Jacob. How far was he willing to push himself to get that blessing of God? And I think that's a really a beautiful example uh, sets up for us. Often we try to do it under our own power rather than under... Uh, trying to give it to God. And that's one of the things that we have to be careful of, uh, that we're trying to get God's blessing through our good works instead of just asking God to give it to us. Um, notice what God here. Here's the big thing with Jacob. I talked about his character issues coming into this. The, the name Jacob means heel grabber in the original language, and the, the, the connotations behind that is, is kind of a... Uh, um, he would be kind of conniver and a schemer. That's, that's kind of the name, uh, where the name comes from. Israel means God prevails or Prince of the King. And so God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, Prince of the King. The idea of that relationship that he has with God, I love that part, that personal part of it. Uh, really an illustration of us coming from being sinners to believers as we make that step. But we see that... Um, that's really important. I, I, I just love that he changed who Jacob kind of who Jacob was um, in, in that close relationship with um, with God. I think you see that change that happens in Jacob from then on um, that he is a different man, and that's that's important for us to understand. Okay, let's finish up the story. Um, was it twenty seven? I was going to read to about thirty. It says this. Uh, he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall be no longer called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it you who ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, and the word Peniel means uh, face of God. So he calls this place face of God, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Like in the Old Testament, the idea was if you've seen the holy God, you uh, um, 
you would die. You couldn't handle his holiness because you were a sinner. And so that's, you know, he understands theologically what's important. So Jacob called face, uh, name of the place Peniel, saying, For I've seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. So one of the things that we have to understand, I think as we finish up this study, you see how uh, it changed who Jacob was, and that's really our goal. We need to understand that we need to cling to God. Um, change is scary sometimes. Change is inevitable. And so we constantly need to cling to God because that's going to change uh, our parameters on how we handle change. Uh, handle change with God is a lot easier than handling change on our own. <clears throat> it's super important to understand that. There's always change in this life. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. Not all change is... For the better sometimes we have to go through a hard season uh, before we can get out on the other side but it doesn't matter whether good times or bad times we need to fully put our uh, trust in god we need to cling to god uh, desperate desperately we need to uh, let god uh, allow god to help us well hopefully you've uh, uh, learned something this evening of uh, the story of jacob uh, Jacob's story here in Genesis is a great story. All these stories in Genesis uh, are awesome. Um, I want you to have uh, hopefully have a great evening. Take some time to read uh, maybe chapter 32 and 33 and see how, especially 33, see how the meeting with Jacob and Esau goes. And when Jacob finally put it in God's hands, it really changed the dynamic of what really happened in that situation. So it's kind of a neat story. I hope you have a great evening. And I hope we can get back together soon. Let's pray real quick, and we'll let you go. And dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for all the blessings you give us. We ask you to help us to just desperately cling to you. Help us to realize that change is inevitable. Change always happens, but when we put our trust in you, we can have the confidence to move forward. Continue to bless us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, have a great night, and may God bless you.